Meredith uh, Miller, are you with us? I'm here. Okay. Oh, I'm perfect. sorry to keep you waiting, Meredith. No worries. I hope it's, it's, it wasn't boring. It was fantastic. <laughs> So you are a uh, trauma coach, author and speaker, and you, as we have here the information, te you teach the mindsets, tools and actions to help others recover after relational trauma. And in fact, in, in this uh, point in time, we have a, a, a really problematic relationship between government and the people. So this is also a trauma, we are basically in a trauma post or still ongoing trauma constellation. So what is it that you would, um, you pointed out also that we are looking at some sort of abuse dynamics here. And I think, you know, I've been thinking that because everyone is always so, I mean, that there were these things, my body, my choice, you know, I mean, everyone's so aware of like that it, there shouldn't be any transgressional things, you know, that you respect the limits of the other the physical limits, especially and psychological limits. And all of a sudden, all that is gone, you know, like everyone is really just or like at what we have here government is like forcing you to do things you don't want and neighbors are forcing you or like pushing you to do things you don't want and it's it's a very strange dynamics yeah i'm curious what you have to say about this it really is what we're looking at is from the micro to the macro example so in the micro example we have the individual and their relationship for example an abusive relationship that an individual is in or the relationship the individual has with the government but then as we move along the continuum to the macro we see systems forming we see families workplaces organizations social groups and society at large And we see the same patterns from the individual, from the micro level to the macro. What happens in the, in the systems, starting from the family all the way through society, is it takes on additional characteristics because the system is greater than the sum of all the individual parts that make it up. So what we can look at is, is the appearance of these same patterns of abuse. And I think one of the most important things to look at is the cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. Cognitive dissonance, for example, at the individual level, let's say you have someone that you love, a sister, a friend, someone in an abusive relationship, and you sit them down and you say, look, I think you're being abused. This happened, that happened, that happened. And what you're doing is you're presenting evidence, facts, logic to this person about what you're noticing. But what happens That person is not going to understand. They're not going to accept what you're saying. They're going to start to provide excuses, explanations, rationalizations that counter every point you're making. And if you insist on showing them the facts and the evidence, they'll start to attack you so they can dismiss what you're saying. Why? Because all of this information that you're presenting, this, these, this evidence and these facts, creates this deep mental conflict with what they truly want to believe. They want to believe this person is the love of their life, or they want to believe that their abusive parent loves them and wants the best for them. And this mental conflict is irreconcilable. So what happens is the brain, and not the logical part of the brain, but the more primitive parts of the brain, goes into denial. It's like a short circuit on an electrical system. This is a built-in survival mechanism into the human being. But unfortunately, this is also what keeps people stuck in abusive relationships because they stay stuck in that state of denial, of defense, where they can't see the truth. So there really is no waking people up to the abuse. There is no presenting them with sufficient amounts of truth and evidence and logic that will snap them out. How does the person come out of that is like a frying pan to the head lesson. It's something so shocking that it pierces their denial. And the truth becomes a visceral experience, not a logical experience, not an intellectual experience, but a visceral experience through which the person can no longer unsee what was just seen. 
And so we see that same dynamic, the cognitive dissonance. We see lots of individuals in the cognitive dissonance. Many people want to believe that their government wants the best for them, that the government is there to take care of them, to protect for them, to provide for them in some kind of way. And they would never do such a thing, such as that which we're observing now in the world. And we can even look at terminology. You know, it's amazing the abuse of language um, that they've done since the beginning, since 2020, when this hypnotic induction began into this trance. Words like social distancing, mm. this phrase in itself elicits cognitive dissonance. Why? Because these two words are complete opposites. Mm. We have social, which means connection. And to the mammalian brain, because humans are mammals, Social means safe. Being connected with other mammals and other humans makes us feel safe. It makes the nervous system feel safe. Distancing is the exact opposite. It's a disconnection. It's not social. It makes us feel unsafe. And when we put these two words together, social and distancing, which evoke completely opposite feelings and understandings, the brain enters into that short circuit, into denial. So it becomes very difficult to think when we're in that state. Well, unless, unless you question what's going on, right? Correct. And that's very difficult for someone who's in that state mm -hmm. because they'll, they'll have moments of lucidity. I think I heard Ariane talking about this earlier too, where maybe some of these leaders even have moments of lucidity or they don't entirely believe what's going on. What you see in an abuse victim is they go in and out of truth mm -hmm. and fantasy. And so they'll have moments where they can see it, but it's so overwhelming and so uncomfortable that the brain will short circuit back into the denial until they get to that point where something so shocking happens. And we may be nearing that point in the world. It may be that crisis on top of crisis on top of crisis. It seems like we're getting to that point now where they're going to start layering on top of the pandemic more and more crises, the supply chain, the food, the, the energy, like all of these things are happening at once. And so it, it may be that more people start to wake up as the crisis pierces their denial. Mm -hmm. um, when I first heard the word Uh, social distancing, I immediately thought this does not make any sense. Something is not right. Um, and uh, because it's obvious, uh, one is the opposite of the other. It doesn't match. And then um, after we listened to, we interviewed, one of the people who we interviewed was the uh, Holocaust survivor, uh, Vera Sharaf. And she explained to us about euphemisms euphemisms. Um, and that's what this is, basically. It tells you that distancing yourself from others is social because it means, yeah, it's safe. The exact opposite is true. And the funny thing is that what you're saying is that many people who fall victim to this, have, just like in, a, in an abusive relationship, do not have the capacity to see that It doesn't make any sense. Right, because in that state of denial and defensiveness, mm -hmm. the person has no access to the logical brain because the logical brain is the neocortex. It's that human mm -hmm. aspect, the evolutionary brain. But then it comes back to the primal states of the brain, the primal parts of the brain, which are concerned with survival, uh -huh. right? And so, so it becomes survival. And so they're listening to the propaganda, to those repeated phrases, the repeated language that's being used that tells them what's safe, which is, as you said, the exact opposite of safe. And, but can I ask you, like, I mean, when you're looking at these abusive situations, you made the example that you have someone where there's love involved in the beginning and then it may be, or, you know, someone has a bad partner choice kind of that it's maybe like a codependence on like someone who's abusive, you know, kind of this kind of trauma-based partner picking. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right term. But um, so in this case, there was maybe like love or like friendship involved in the beginning. And then it turns kind of uh, goes, everything goes, goes uh, uh, belly up yeah. or like it's not, not working in the right way. But here, I mean, would you describe like the situation that we have to our government is also some sort of love Or is this, is this, or like, uh, you know, close feeling of closeness or like fa fatherly, motherly constellation? 
Um, or is this like even maybe this this abusal, like what we what we saw in this uh, Stockholm syndrome, is maybe even love inducing in a like sick way, you know? And maybe that's also what we're seeing now that these people are going over the top because some of them are really defending the government that maybe they were like critical like in the past of a lot of things you know corrupt and whatever but now it's like the heroes to some extent I mean that's happening for some people what, what do you think like is that a combination of things that's now going on yeah it's actually the abuse cycle so there's mm -hmm. two phases in the abuse cycle what we call love bombing and that doesn't have to be in a romantic sense It can be someone giving you compliments, paying you for things, buying you things, sending you economic stimulus money in the mail, for example, or providing free food, or the government just telling you, we want the best for you, your health matters, you know, this is the important thing, we just want the best for you, we're trying to help, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the love bombing aspect. And then the other cycle, the other phase of the abuse cycle is the devaluation, You're dirty, you're sick, you're dangerous, you're putting people at risk. So they go back and forth between the two. So for example, another example, um, love bombing could simply be the absence of abuse, the temporary absence of abuse. So in a relationship, there's going to be moments where the abuser senses they've gone a little too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The victim is starting to figure it out. They need to pull the, the victim back in. So in society, they push the lockdowns a little too hard. They start to notice people are suddenly starting to maybe wake up a little bit or starting to question things. So then they set people free for a while. Oh, you can travel. You can do things now. You can take off the mask. But this is temporary. And now we see the lockdowns coming back. We see the restrictions coming back. So it's going back and forth in this cycle. It's like an intermittent reinforcement which again is part of the, the foundation of the cognitive dissonance. So it keeps people very confused. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's very interesting. And, and do you think, um, you know, I asked this question to Ariane before. So, so um, do you think that's, that's part of a plan or is this, is this, you know, like a social engineering kind of uh, procedure or do you think they just feel instinctive, oh, instinctively, wow, we've gone a little too far, let's give them this kind of thing? Or is this like, you know, structured? Because it seems to be, to me, it seems very um, orchestrated. From my perspective as well, it seems highly orchestrated. Um, I agree with Ariane, what she said about this is actually a continuation of Nazism. Uh, because after World War II, America, for example, imported hundreds of Nazi scientists in Operation Paperclip, and they put them mm -hmm. to work in psychiatry, in government organizations. In psychiatry and psychology, they ended up working on behavior modification science. This became the foundation of all the social media. So we see that social media was a key component in making this work. 10 years ago, this wouldn't have worked. They actually tried the pandemic thing in 2009 and it flopped. Um, why? The social media was just in its infancy. It was just starting. They knew the science behind the social media. Some Facebook executives even talked about this. They saw the science, they knew what they were doing and they did it anyways. So that behavior modification, the foundation of that is like provocation reaction solution. So they provoke an emotion, which fear is the most powerful emotion for this, right? So they provoke fear, then that creates an emotional reaction, and then it gets people to beg for a solution to that fear, which the government is happy to provide. It's the solution. It's everything they were driving us toward from the beginning. So this is the cycle. And so it seems that this has been decades in the making. It's been like a very slow and gradual buildup. And now we're kind of here at the vertical part of the curve mm -hmm. where it's happening exponentially fast. Mm -hmm. Is um, when you're saying that maybe the kind of the, the shocking experience that is necessary to wake people up could be the piling uh, of all of these um, crises on top of each other. Does that mean that people, some of the people who are still like sitting on the fence and, and not beyond, um, who, who can still be approached, does that mean that it, it gets to be too much for them so that they're going to th think this cannot be real? Is, is that the kind of situation that you expect? 
I'm hopeful that more people will wake up as it intensifies. I Unfortunately, it's going to intensify. In every abusive mm-hmm. relationship, the abuse escalates. Mm-hmm. Even when you call them out, you know, as we've seen more and more truth has come out and, and people are going, how, how is this still standing? Yeah. How is it so possible? How are these people not in jail? Because they never admit to the con. They just double down on it. And they go back to that gaslighting campaign. And so what we've seen since the beginning of 2020 is a massive gaslighting campaign. For those who aren't familiar with that term, gaslighting is a distortion of the perception of reality to the point where a person starts to think they're crazy for questioning the reality that's being promoted. So we see that in the mainstream media, in the news, we see it on social media with the fact checking, the censorship, everything is meant because the whole narrative is sustained based on this gaslighting campaign. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopeful that maybe more people will start to wake up as the intensity and the shock of the things that are happening pierces their denial. Mm -hmm. The other problem is that we're going to see an epidemic of mental illness because there's going to be so many people that are so severely traumatized that are unable to see reality when it's revealed to them. So they're going to go into states of mental illness. Um, Earlier, you were talking about the delusional psychosis. That's one of them. You know, but we've even seen what happens is when people get into this state, they feel like there's no way out. Right. That becomes part of the learned helplessness. And so then they develop self-destructive habits. It's like a feedback loop that happens and it just gets worse and worse. And so we've seen like last year, 600 percent alcohol sales up. We've seen a great increase in drug overdoses, increase in suicides. Last year, some doctors were saying they saw a year's worth of suicide in one month. Yes. So we're, we're seeing, you know, the this, this self-destructive And we're seeing also, you know, that's the individual. We're also seeing relationally what this is doing in relationships between people. It's driving people further apart. It's causing this great polarity. It's causing this great tension between people. And also when we as individuals are traumatized, it becomes very difficult to connect with other people to get that co-regulation that mammals need to feel safe and social because trauma is a disconnection. And that's really, I mean, the pandemic, the plague that we're in right now is disconnection. They're having us disconnected from other people, disconnected from ourselves because they're, this whole gaslighting campaign, it teaches you not to trust yourself not to trust your perception of reality, not to trust your sense of self and your God-given right to sovereignty. You know, it's, it's actually part of the cult dynamic. So that's where the system takes on additional components that the individual or that micro relationship doesn't have. The system develops a cult dynamic where, you know, part of the cult is that your individual identity is sacrificed. It's usually destroyed through trauma, trauma based mind control. And as your individual identity is destroyed, it's replaced with the group identity, which also corresponds to some of the things that Ariana was talking about earlier, that there are some individuals that have the capability of stepping out of that group identity and recognizing they have the right to think for themselves. They still have the capacity to think for themselves because when you're in that group enmeshment in that identity, it's terrifying to leave, not intellectually, but at a deep primal level in the brain because we were programmed biologically for survival that we need the herd to survive. So even if the herd is marching toward the slaughterhouse, it's easier to go along because it's so difficult to think for yourself and it's terrifying to be outcasted. And that's exactly what happens to people who question the abuse, people in cults who wake up. And in the very basic structure of a cult is an abusive family. If you wake up in that abusive family to the abuse and you start to talk about the abuse, you'll be attacked, you'll be smeared, you'll be hurt, you'll be punished. The rest of the group will try to pull you back in and not allow you to have those thoughts, to have those beliefs, not allow you to individuate and separate yourself from that group. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Like, um, 
And uh, for when we're looking again at the abusive, the normal abusive constellation uh, between maybe two people, or like also it could be like what you mentioned, like a cult, like 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 some sort of sect where people join and they want to break free from that. The only thing you say is like a like a shocking constellation, and is there anything else that you know motivates people to get out of that? So when I'm working with people one on one who are trying to get out of abusive relationships, you know, I tell them that that cognitive dissonance is going to dissolve in a spontaneous moment. That's the part that we can't control. That's the sudden divine intervention or whatever that is that brings the shock that pierces the person's denial. But how can a person help themselves to yeah. get there mm -hmm. is relentlessly facing the truth. And mm -hmm. the problem is that this goes against our entire biological programming. We were programmed to seek social belonging before truth. We will sacrifice the truth in order to have the social belonging. So that's that group dynamic. So a person is going to have a difficult time doing that, even in a one-on-one -on -one relationship, because there's a sense of belonging in that relationship. And because the other person has told them that they'll never find anyone else to love them. They'll never find anyone else to accept them. This is as best as it's going to get. Don't you dare leave. So the person is terrified to leave this dynamic. And could it be if you offer like a different peer group? You know, say like, for instance, it's the grass is greener over here. Come to the other side and get out of that abusive thing and have fun with us. Is that um, sort of inspirational uh, from your experience in situations that are not going well? Usually a person will reject that. They will find any way to reject, to attack anything that's conf confronting what they, their fantasy, what they want to believe about the world. And so that's why the victim needs to face over and over again the truth. We have victims write what's called a sobriety list, you know, write down everything that person did from the very beginning of that relationship that was hurtful, manipulative, abusive. Why? Because as soon as their mind goes back into the denial or they want to indulge in the fantasy, which they're highly invested in, they pull out the list and they start reading these bullet points of everything that happened. And maybe at some point something jars their mind and they come back into lucidity. So they have to face the truth over and over again. But the thing is that this can't come from outside. Anything that we say, all the evidence, all the truth we can present, it has to come from inside. There has to be the internal drive. The person has to want to know the truth. And the difficulty is that doesn't usually happen until that point where it's been pierced spontaneously by some event that's taken place that's forced the person to see something different. What is the ultimate goal of all of this? We have spoken, for example, to uh, former members of the British intelligence uh, services, and they all agree, everyone who we spoke with, that this is an agenda, and it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it, um, it's mainly driven by... Um, this is a huge psych, psych, psyop, psychological operation. Um, that's why it took such enormous training and planning. It, this didn't happen overnight. This is nothing that happened spontaneously, but rather this has been planned for probably at least a decade, maybe longer. But what is the ultimate goal of what they're doing? It is probably totalitarianism. Um, And that is a result of some people who are high up in power or have a lot of money um, being afraid that we're, find, we're going to find out about them. Is, is that really the goal, totalitarianism, so that those who are in power and who have more money than they should have, because, and now they feel guilty about it, is it really that this is because they're afraid to be found out and that that's why they need to get complete control over us, which is totally impossible. Is that so? From my perspective, I agree with that. I think the ultimate goal is the control. Uh, if you look mm -hmm. at a psychopath in a relationship, or any abuser in a relationship, what is their goal? It's control. Mm -hmm. It may be extracting other resources. Certainly money has something to do with it, but it's beyond money. What does the money give them? It gives them power yeah. and control. 
And so if we look at this, everything that's going on is about control. And as long as they can maintain that control under any cost, no matter how many people they have to get rid of, because it's certainly a lot easier to control a smaller group of people than it is a larger group. Of people. <coughs> Mm. But it, it does seem to be control. That, that's the ultimate goal. That's why all of the abuse dynamics work. That's why as soon as they sense they're losing control of people, they're going to mm. come back mm. and start giving us some, something you know, to seduce us back into the dynamic. So, and, the, and the way out, I, this is what I wrote down. The way out is relentless confrontation with what's with reality, what's what's really going on, with the true facts. The way out of the cognitive dissonance, yes. the way out of the bigger picture, I think, is self responsibility. Mm -hmm. I think as each individual takes personal responsibility of their life and of their choices and of resolving our own traumas, because we we've all been born into this world that is founded on trauma. You know, from tr transgenerational trauma in families to larger historical traumas, even birth can be traumatic. We have to look within and recognize what are the, the traumas that we still have left unresolved within us, work on healing those, work on taking greater responsibility of our life, because that self-responsibility is the threshold between the victim stage, which is based on powerlessness, which is where the great majority of people are at right now, and to the stage of being a survivor and being empowered. That's the hardest threshold to cross. What I see in abuse is that the majority of people stay stuck in that victim stage. They don't take the self-responsibility to get over that threshold into the mm -hmm. empowerment. So I see the same pattern in the world. I see most people staying in that victimization, unable to take self-responsibility, hoping that the government will save them. We have to save ourselves. We have to take responsibility for our part. And I think that's the amazing thing because we individuals form the collective, right? So as we individuals work to heal ourselves, as more of us work to heal and take responsibility for ourselves and what we're producing and contributing to the world around us, even if that's just a, our family, our very small social circle locally, that spreads, that becomes something that ends up healing the world. I think another thing that's a mistake is to focus on changing the world because the change starts inside, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing we have control over, the learned helplessness, complete loss of control. So people give up, they go into states of despair, makes them easy to control. So what can we take control over? Not everything that's out there, but what's inside here. And, um, but like you know, uh, Professor Desmet the, from Belgium, the um, um, psychologist, the, the psychologist and psychoanalyst, uh, you know, he said that you know the t totalitarianism, just what you mentioned about like the abusive situation, has a tendency of of growing wilder and wilder as it as time passes. So why is that? Is it because the um you know they they feel that it's becoming like the the illogical or like the you know the the abusive part is becoming more obvious to the victim and that's why they they think they want to you know push it a little bit further so um in order to to get back on power or is it like a self um, I don't know some self propelling kind of scheme? Why do you think that it might be? I think it's that the controller, the abuser, the psychopath is is seeking the thrill. It's like a heroin addict. They need more and more and more to get the same feeling. So in an abusive relationship, the abuser is chasing the dragon, looking to get more and more of that thrill, which means they need to go more and more beyond. They need to constantly increment the abuse that's taking place. And do you, you know what? Do you think that's the same here now? I think it is. It's like an addiction. Mm -hmm. It's a very yeah. sick addiction that they they can't control. So it's not it's not about like um, I I don't know just like keeping keeping the the game um, on because the uh, you know they're afraid of that they might be um, if it all goes down that they might be jailed or something. But it's also the kick at the same time that it's kind yes. of I mean not sort of on a sick way. It's kind of fun to see people like being more and more put down and you know abused and 
Yeah, it's both of that. It's the perversion of needing more of that control, more thrill to get the same reward, the same feeling, the same dopamine hit that they got from it. And also, as was mentioned before, you know, the, the fear of being found out, the uh, imposters, imposter syndrome, which the covert form of abusers, what we're seeing now is the covert form of what happened in Germany in the 1930s and 40s. That was a more overt. It was more obvious. The covert is the more sophisticated version. And so the covert abuser, the more sophisticated abuser, has a deep insecurity and a deep imposter syndrome. And like Ariane was talking about earlier, the mediocrity, being terrified that they're going to be exposed for being mediocre, unqualified, not the image that they're trying to create. It's about maintaining that image. So being terrified of being found out mm -hmm. that they're actually not what they're claiming to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the uh, covert version of what happened overtly in the Third Reich, yeah, um, it is becoming more and more overt now, and that means that it's escalating, and that means, in my view, from what you're telling me and, and from what we've heard from all the psychologists and psychiatrists, psychiatrists that the other side too is in a panic uh not all of them maybe uh it's a, it's probably a mix if i if i get you correctly it's a mix of seeking the thrill and at the same time um being afraid oh my god this time they're going to really get me this time they're going to really find out so we're going to have to go further and further and further is that what's happening i think so And you're right, it is becoming more overt. And that's the thing that happens in an abusive relationship as well with a covert abuser because there are different types. And of course, they can go back and forth in the tactics because when you're behind closed doors and no one in the outside world can see, that's when they can be more overtly abusive. But when they're in front of other observers and people, then they have to be more covert. But over time, that covert abuser does become more and more overt. Mm -hmm. Uh, we uh, we have a friend in Finland. Um, she um, well, I, I I guess I shouldn't uh, expose her identity, but she has she's very good friends with someone who works for the European Commission. And when these commissioners get together, she explained to us this is what her friend told her. Um, and they watch the news, or they they're in a meeting, and then they watch the news or watch what's going on outside of their little. Uh, European Parliamentary uh, Bureau, um, they, this is what she explained to us, they uh, actually laugh their asses off because they can't believe how stupid people are. Is that typical? Yes. And I think this is the thing. We're human, right? We've all had this thought, like, how can people be so stupid? I admit I'm not above this. But this is where we need to bring in the humility to understand that this is not an intelligence thing. This is not about intelligence. This is the primal parts of the brain. The human nervous system was just programmed to respond this way to stress, to abuse, to trauma. They know this. They've known this for decades in the research that they've done with trauma-based mind control. They have done this on the public for a long time. They even use entertainment, Hollywood, you know, to carry these sorts of things out. So I think that we, we need to have compassion for people, just like we would have. Imagine if that was someone that you loved and they were in an abusive relationship to have compassion, but to also have boundaries because mm -hmm. that person will attack you. Right. If you try to show them that they're in an abusive relationship. So it's also important to have those boundaries and to connect with people who are living in reality. Because that keeps you sane. When you're trying to escape a cult, even a family that's abusive, you need to have allies outside of that system who are living in reality, who can validate reality. Because everybody living in that system is living in that delusional psychosis, the very distorted reality. Mm -hmm. And what's going to happen, I mean, if it goes down, what's going to happen to all the, the perpetrators? You know, I mean, are they going to wake up and see what they've done or will, will they be in some sort of denial toward, oh, it was necessary and I did my best and, or I was always part of the resistance or I don't know what kind of <laughs> things might pop up. 
I imagine it will be those sorts of things. You know, if I look at from the micro level and I see, you know, when abusers are found out, what do they do? They double down. They play the victim. One of the things we call in the terminology of narcissistic abuse is DARVO. It's an acronym, denial, attack, reverse, victim and offender. What does that mean? You tell a person this is abusive. They flip it around on you. Now you're the abuser and they're the victim. And we can watch this in the in the public dialogue. Anytime you try to talk about the truth or even just in the media, the way they smear conspiracy theorists and anybody trying to talk about the truth, they flip it around. They mm -hmm. play the victim. So I fully expect a lot of these perpetrators to play the victim because that's that's what they do. I have the hopes that there will be some sort of Nuremberg trial again, though I hope it will be significantly better than the last one, which only brought to trial a very small amount of the perpetrators Excellent. and Excellent. then imported the rest of those and installed them in society in places that they could do significantly more harm over the long term. I would hope that we can learn from that. You know, we say history repeats itself. It repeats itself because we haven't learned. History repeats itself is the macro version of the repetition compulsion at the individual level. The individual goes through a trauma and then their whole life, they choose similar people and situations that remind them of how they felt in that early life trauma because they're seeking healing, but they're doing this unconsciously. They're unconsciously repeating the same traumas. That's what we're doing as society. We're repeating the same traumas. I truly hope that because the level of this trauma is so big involving the entire world at the same time, I hope that the magnitude of that is going to be comparative to the magnitude of awakening potential of the possibility for us to now finally end this legacy of trauma and tragedy and abuse and violence that we've been repeating for so many generations so that we can make different choices and create a different future with a much better potential for humanity. I do think this is a turning point. It's a make or break. We're either going to go full on down that road of totalitarianism until I don't know what the end will be of that, some sort of mass disaster. It's already disastrous. I think it can get significantly worse. Or we're going to choose at some point collectively because enough individuals are making the internal choice in their own personal life a different path, making different choices. And that's the harder decision because the easy road is just just to go, just to follow the herd and not think and not change and certainly not heal the trauma because that's very challenging and painful. It's easier just to numb it out, to find distractions and escapism, which of course they're providing for us, right? You know, they're providing plenty of distractions for people they, they have for many decades, but especially in the last decade, there's been so much more of distractions with the internet and things. And now they want to bring out the metaverse the virtual reality, you know, so that when reality is so horrible, instead of facing that and resolving it and dealing with it and confronting it, people escape into the fantasy. Yeah, and we have to make sure that they understand that real life is much better than the fantasy version. It can um, be. Oh, uh, it can. In some cases, it's not. Yeah. Uh, but um, the one of the things that Professor Desmond explained to us is that uh, totalitarianism is self-destructive. Sooner or later, it'll self-destruct. The big question then is how much damage will they be able to do to us before they self-destruct? Um, and of course, nobody knows, but it is going on right now. It's, uh, it's getting crazier and crazier and it's becoming more and more overt. I have the hope that more and more people like us will uh, come to their senses, sort of. Uh, and that, that group, I think that's about 40% of the people are sort of like sitting on the fence and don't know which way to go, but that that group is still approachable and that more and more of these people will begin to ask questions, uh, which will ultimately then uh, turn the tide. It's, uh, some people say that it's enough if 3.5% of the population or maybe 5% or 10% realize what's going on, that's good enough. I'm not so sure about that. Um, but it definitely is important to have those who, um, who can make decisions 
r- rational decisions um, on our side because um, it, I, I have a feeling that those who are who have fallen victim to this narrative are the ones who, um, as one of those psychiatrists who we spoke with explained, escape into uh, not fantasy, but they, they, they sort of revert to infan. It, what is it? What's the word? Infantilization. Yeah, that's what it is. They don't, they don't want to grow up. They just want to keep listening to someone telling them what to do. So this group of people is, cannot be approached by us, but it's not really important. I, I hate to say that, but it's not really important. Those who are willing to think outside the box and who are willing to question authority, they're the ones who make work finally going in the long run are going to make the, the difference, I believe. And those are the ones who are on our side already. I hope many more will join. Yeah, there's really no convincing people. Just like there's no convincing a victim that they're in an abusive relationship. There's no convincing that group of people to see reality because they don't want to see it. That infantilization process has been happening for a long time in society. So unfortunately, a lot of people look to the government, to the state as mommy and daddy to protect them. Right. That that's a fantasy. That's Mm -hmm. not real. And it's unfortunate, but then there are those who have the more functional adult capacity in their brain to say, no, I need to take the responsibility to rescue myself, to provide for myself, to provide for my family, because the government is not going to do that. That's not their job. So this is what it, what it boils down to, infantilization versus self-responsibility. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a, I think it's a really... Do you know, it's it's also a rough ride for them because, uh, you know, once it, as you said, like once it becomes more obvious to, to some people, I mean, that because it's so extreme, it's, um, I mean, they're risking a lot of things, you know, they're risking everything. So it's it's for them as well. It's, it's, a, it's a game of life and death because they're well, going to yeah. be like, I mean, do you know, I, do, I don't think that people would kill them because, I mean, obviously... I mean, we are against, like, uh, violence anyway, you know, but I think it's more that they'd be socially destroyed, you know, if this, is, if this becomes, like, if it becomes obvious to a lot of people what's been going on. Right. At what cost? I think that's something Reiner had asked earlier, too. Like, how far does this go? Even though the totalitarian, totalitarian system eventually will implode, just like every abusive relationship, but at what cost? You know, at what cost to the individuals, at what cost to society, at what cost to human life? Well, I mean, we have to make sure or we have to do everything that we can to end things as soon as possible because it's like, you know, it's already cost quite a bit of life and and cost so much pain and and all that. So I think it's really about time that it collapses. And because, like you said earlier at the very beginning, we're not even in the post-trauma phase yet, right? So we we haven't even begun to see the long-term effects of what's already happened to this point. This is going, especially among the children, this is going to have severe long-term repercussions, the post-trauma of this. And it's going to require a lot of healing, even if this just ended suddenly now, today, no more damage. There's still significant significant trauma to work through yeah that's true wow so it's a lot of work <laughs> it is ahead of us it's worth at it. any rate it's definitely worth it it can only get better <laughs> that's the thing about trauma is that trauma is both destructive and awakening the mm. trauma destroys the sense of normality the person never can go back to who they were before the trauma. We as a society will never go back to what we used to call normal. It's gone for good. We need to mourn that. Part of healing the trauma is a grieving process. That's gone now. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because now the awakening of the trauma allowed that in that destruction of the trauma allows us to create something better, allows us to create something new reaching new potential that we perhaps couldn't have contacted within ourselves individually or even as a society until that trauma took place. So it comes with both a curse and a blessing. 
Well, I can definitely see that there is light at the end of the tunnel. I agree. And I really hope that that happens soon. Yeah, me too. Huh. But you know, Again. I think what, what the good thing is about this also is that it's such a huge collective trauma. I mean, it's good and bad at the same time. But maybe if you come out of like a personal abusive relationship, you know, I mean, there's maybe also something like individual guilt feelings or like anger and all that. But now if, if it's also possible to, you know, then maybe hopefully... Um, join with others in this coll collective um, anger and frustration and pain and, and sadness, you know, that's also something, if you do this collectively, I can see also that this might uh, propel like the healing process, just like as if you do like, um, you know, self-help groups with other traumatized people, you know, in this talking about it, like in the group together and find new ways. I think that's, that can also, you know, speed up things in a way. That's, That's what very I would true. Hope. That co-regulation is part of what helps us heal the trauma. So as we connect with other people, you know, why are things so traumatic, especially in childhood, if no one was there for you? Maybe two children went through a very similar experience. One children had a parent, a caretaker, someone who was there for them, who hugged them, who held them, who made them feel safe and connected. They're not going to have such severe post-trauma, maybe not even have post-trauma after that event. The child who was left alone, abandoned, not believed, told it was their fault, that sort of thing, that child is going to have severe trauma. Mm -hmm. So if we connect with others, other people are there, other people see the same reality, other people feel the same emotions, we process this grief together, we connect together, this is a very healing thing that can be done. The challenge for so many people right now, I think, is so many people feel so alone. And that's the whole purpose of this, the social isolation, because the isolation is necessary for the abuse to take place. So many people see the truth, see reality, but they feel so alone because maybe no one else in their life or very few people in their life can see it. And that's part of the traumatization. So I think it's amazing the work that you all are doing to bring people together, to connect everybody who's seeing this sort of thing so we don't feel so alone, so we do feel more connected. Yeah, we're all trying to do play our part in this game, um, and we're trying to take over the lead roles. You are, we are, all of the good people who are really interested in the good of, of mankind. We, uh, I, we don't pretend, we mean it, because if we didn't, we wouldn't do this. Right. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Meredith, this was great. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you Thank for you. inviting me. Oh, thanks, thanks for being here. And and I again I apologize for keeping you waiting. But no I, I see that you did enjoy listening to uh Ariane. It was great. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. We'll stay in touch. Okay. All right, because I know we're gonna need much more of this when this whole house of card collapses, because yeah. that's when the real work starts. And most Correct. of this has to do with psychology. Correct. Okay. Well, thank you and very much and have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.